Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Journey to the East by Herman Hess. So, uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will admit, I'm definitely not a scholar when it comes to this book, because I read it and kind of don't really know what happened. It is kind of a metaphysical journey, that's how I've been describing it. So it's almost, it almost doesn't matter that if you don't know what happened, because it's all about the journey along the way. Dane reads... In my head, anyway. So, through time and space in search of ultimate truth, Herman Hesse's timelessly brilliant novels have a wide appeal, particularly among youthful readers who see a close affinity between their own struggles and ideals and those expressed in Hesse's writings. In The Journey to the East, a haunting allegorical novel, the narrator travels through time in the external and internal worlds in search of ultimate truth. Although the pilgrimage to the East is across an imaginary land, it also embraces Europe and takes place not only in our own century but in the Middle Ages and Renaissance as well. The narrator is accompanied by his fellow members of the League, which includes both real and fictitious characters, Plato, Pythagoras, Don Quixote, Tristram, Shandy, Baudelaire and Leo, the lowliest member of the group, yet paradoxically also the most important. One of Hesse's best works, The Journey to the East, is closest in conception to his Nobel Prize winning novel, The Glass Bead Game which I haven't read yet. So, some tab. So it starts out with an essay called Poet of the Interior Journey by Timothy Leary, um, who is obviously, he's like the godfather of LSD. And I quite like this, I think this sort of summarizes what I said about not really having a fucking clue what happened in this. As John Cage is fond of reminding us, writing is one thing and reading is another. All writings, all authors are thoroughly misunderstood. Most wise men do not write because they know this. The wise man has penetrated through the verbal curtain, seen and known and felt the life process. We owe him our gratitude when he remains with us and tries to induce us to share the joy. The great writer is the wise man who feels compelled to translate the message into words. The message is, of course, around us and in us at all moments. Everything is a clue. Everything contains all the message. To pass it on in symbols is unnecessary, but perhaps the greatest performance of man. Wise men write with deliberation in the esoteric. It's the way of making a rose or a baby. The exoteric form is Maya, the hallucinatory facade. The meaning is within. The greatness of a great book lies in the esoteric, the seed meaning concealed behind the net of symbols. All great writers write the same book, changing only the exoteric trappings of their time and tribe. Most readers miss the message of Hess. Entranced by the pretty dance of plot and theme, they overlook the seed message. Hess is a trickster. Like nature in April, he dresses up his code in fancy plumage. The literary reader picks the fruit, eats quickly and tosses the core to the ground. But the seed, the electrical message, the code, is in the core. And then of course Leary starts talking about psychedelic drugs, which you always knew was going to happen. So anyway, skipping into the novel proper. So there's a reference to Siddhartha, our wise friend from the East, which um, is another topic that, that Hess has written about. And the quote is, words do not express thoughts very well. Everything immediately becomes a little different, a little distorted, a little foolish. And yet it also pleases me and seems right that what is of value and wisdom to one man seems nonsense to another. And I thought this was quite insightful and very true. It is a well-known human weakness that anything we lose assumes an exaggerated value and seems less dispensable than those things still in our possession. Yet although many of the articles whose loss in the Morbio Gorge troubled us so much did in fact turn up later or prove themselves to be unimportant, nevertheless it is unfortunately true that we were at the time justifiably alarmed at the loss of many extremely important things. And I think that's an also, also an important reminder that possessions are temporary, you know? Experiences are permanent. And so uh, someone's selling a violin and uh, we get this little conversation. Uh, you have enough money and yet you sell your violin. Do you not then like music anymore? Oh yes, but it sometimes happens that a man no longer finds pleasure in something that he previously loved. It sometimes happens that a man sells his violin or throws it to the wall or that a painter one day burns all his pictures. Have you never heard of such a thing? Oh yes. That comes from despair. That does happen. I even knew two people who committed suicide. People like that are stupid and can be dangerous. One just cannot help some people. And I quite like this. Um, so we get we learn that the violin makes the person think of King David. I'm not entirely sure who's speaking here because it's been a while since I read it. But uh, King David, what has he to do with it? He was also a musician. When he was quite young, he used to play to King Saul and sometimes dispelled his bad moods with music. Later he became a king himself, a great king full of cares, having all sorts of moods and vexations. He wore a crown and conducted wars and all that kind of thing, and he also did many really wicked things and became very famous. But when I think of his life, the most beautiful part of it all is about the young David with his heart playing music to poor Saul, and it seems a pity to me that he later became a king. 
He was a much happier and better person when he was a musician. Don't normally hear about happy musicians. And so our protagonist here has been working on a, like a written history of the league. And he was doing it behind their back as kind of a secret. And then he gets blessing to do it. And uh, th this little passage here is what happens when he just finds out he has the blessing to do it. And kind of revisits his manuscript. But I think this will be uh, uh, relatable to any, any authors and writers out there. However, the more pages I read of my handwriting, the less did I like the manuscript. Even in my former most despondent hours, it had never seemed so futile and absurd to me as now. Everything didn't seem too confused and stupid. The clearest relationships were distorted. The most obvious were forgotten. The trivial and the unimportant pushed into the foreground. It must be written again right from the beginning. As I continued reading the manuscript, I had to cross out sentence after sentence, and as I crossed them out, they crumpled up on the paper, and the clear sloping letters separated into assorted fragments, into strokes and points, into circles, small flowers and stars, and the pages were covered like carpets with graceful, meaningless, ornamental designs. Soon there was nothing more left of my text. On the other hand, there was much unused paper left for my work. I pulled myself together. I tried to see things clearly. Naturally, I had been unable to give a clear or impartial account before, for everything was in fact concerned with secrets which I was forbidden to reveal by my oath to the League. I had tried to avoid an objective presentation of the story, and without regard to the more important relationships, aims and purposes, I had simply restricted myself to my personal experiences. But one could see where that had led. On the other hand, there was no longer a pledge of silence and no more restrictions. I was given complete official permission, and moreover, the whole of the inexhaustible archives lay open to me. Which almost makes this story in itself like a palimpsest, which is when you kind of take a manuscript and then you cover the manuscript and do something else on it. Because back in the day, parchment was expensive, so if you didn't need something that had been written anymore, you could basically just cover it up and then write over the top of it, you know? A bit like with Tipex. But yes, The Journey to the East by Herman Hesse, uh, very thought-provoking. As I say, it's difficult to follow, but there are lots of these little gems, little ideas in it. It's also very beautifully written, and I've kind of come to expect from Hess that I'm going to struggle to actually kind of stick with what he's saying. My computer monitors have just gone off, that's why it went dark. Um, but yes, I did enjoy reading it. I would recommend it, especially if you've read some Hess before. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5, and I will be reading more of his books shortly. So we have it, that's a short and sweet review of The Journey to the East by Herman Hesse. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.